In compliance with the open meeting laws, if anyone audio or record, video recording this meeting or any part of this meeting, please raise your hand. If so, please no, identify there's yourself. One. There's one for three. Please identify yourself with your name and address. Anybody else? Raise the hands. 22 News. What's your mass news? What's your name? Andrew. Andrew, okay. Anybody else? Uh, for, uh, we have three items on the agenda this evening, and one of them is the old Lyman Road order that was on here before. And I, I've asked, uh, after consulting with our attorney, that's going to be the first item on the agenda. The only thing I ask of the public is please shut off your cell phones or put them on silence. Give your name and address if you should come up to the podium with any comments. No personal attacks, please. And you will have three minutes to speak. After public input, I will hear from uh, our superintendent and our president of the city council. In regards to um, Mr. Stamborski and uh, Laura Stamborski, evidently on February 12th of this year, there was a real estate transaction in the newspaper that was reported to me. And it said something about the sale of property on 19 Martin Street. And it looks like at Holmes property and Daniel Stamborski sold the property. And it was on 19 Martin Street. The constituent that came to me asked me to research in regards to potential of conflict of interest or the appearance of impropriety. So for the attorney, I do have three exhibits. One exhibit indicates that the property on 19 Martin Street was purchased um, back in 2022, and then a house was built on it, and the house was sold for 390000 in 2023. According to the deed from the Register of Deeds, the house was sold by at-home properties. The resident came to me and said, what does at-home properties mean? And I said, quite frankly, I don't know. So when it was researched with the Secretary of State's office, at-home properties is listed as the manager, Laura Stamborski. And then Laura Stamborski and Daniel Stamborski sold the property after they purchased and developed the house. So I have three exhibits. One exhibit says that the at-home properties indicates that Laura Stamborski is the manager. One exhibit is the deed in regards to purchasing the property. And the second is the deed in regards to selling the property. The constituent asked me to contact the Ethics Commission, which in fact I did. The Ethics Commission indicated to me that a disclosure has to be filed with the city clerk's office by Dan Stamborski. At 10 minutes of five today, I was reminded by the constituent, was there any disclosure filed? And as 10 minutes of five, there wasn't. So what the suggestion was by the Ethics Commission attorney was that Daniel Stamborski would have to recluse himself in regards to any type of recommendation. However, the meeting can continue. Other people that have made recommendations can come on record. People that are here to speak in regards to this can speak. I just spoke with Katie of the fire department. She's indicating that she's here today 
And she did get a text. She didn't know what time, but late in the day. So moving on, this is now something that Attorney Garvey should be looking at in regards to the appearance of impropriety and the importance of disclosures that are registered in the city clerk's office. Recently, we've got a few members here from the school department, school committee actually, that went through the same situation. Disclosure was not filed in the city clerk's office and therefore the meeting continued but the person that did not disclose could attend the meeting, but I do believe not participate. So I just wanna bring that to the public's attention because that's what has to be done at some point in time. There should be a disclosure in regards to the financial relationship in this particular incident. Thank you. And if you want, uh, Attorney Garvey, uh, I do have three exhibits that you can have as public record. Do you have any quarrel with those facts, Attorney Garvey? We've got Laura once you've got her hand up over there. Be needed. Well, unfortunately, since I was just learned of this, I have no comments at this time, but I'll be happy to look into it. Thank you. So I'll, make, I'll put this, uh, Councillor Zigarowski, as public record. Okay. Thank you. All right. To continue, uh, Councilman Balakir is here. Do you have to read? of it into the meeting. Okay, to read the order, we'll place those in. No, just read the order, but I'll take Okay, all right. All right, Be before I read the order that's on the agenda for number one, I want to, there's other people that are here. No, 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 I got uh, Councilman Valak here from Ward 4 is here. Our Chief of Police is here, Cap Patrick Major. Ward 6 Councilman Derek Dobez. Captain Katie Kobach. Kobach. Our Superintendent of Public Works, Ms. Batista. Doug Ellis, our City Engineer. And our President of the Council, Frank Laflam. Polio. Anybody? And Councillor Fred Krampus from Ward 5 is on Zoom. Yeah, thank you, Fred. The right, office of the Senator order on Gomez the is also president. Senator uh, Gomez is on. His, his office. office his aide is on. on yeah. Okay. Uh, the first order on the agenda, and I just want to reiterate, I'm going to have public input right at the beginning. You'll have three minutes. Uh, or any other speakers are on, we want to hear what the public has to say about this. Uh, we did have another meeting and we'll discuss that after this. Okay. Be it ordered that the city, the city department recommendations concerning the one way street on Old Lyman Road be presented and discussed at a public safety committee meeting, which we are doing right now. So anybody public wants to get up and speak concerning the Old Lyman Road, please do so. But give your name and address for the public record. You will have three minutes. All right. I, okay. Gary Stamborski, I wasn't planning on yeah, speaking somebody today. Time um, can I just ask for some explanation in the relevant owning property on Martin Street and building property and selling property has to do with this matter? Um, I, I don't get it. I think this is another uh, example of Mary Beth's lack of willingness to work for a solution that helps the entire neighborhood. It feels like she Trying to make sure we can't speak. Well, I, I don't know what to make of that. I wasn't planning on speaking at all tonight. I really was just hoping that our community leaders would pull us together to find something that works for the neighborhood because this clearly doesn't. But can somebody tell me what that means to the meeting? I will have our attorney uh, answer okay. that. Because I can't do it. I'm not an attorney. So would you give your name and address? I'm again? sorry. I thought I said Gary Stamborski, Landing Drive. What's your address? Landing Drive, 48 Landing Drive. All right. Um, but we own all kinds of properties and buy and sell properties. I'm perplexed 
And Mary Beth, maybe you can explain. Okay, no, no, don't, no, 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 no. Through, oh, the chair, I'm sorry. through the chair, okay? So maybe, All your questions will be through me and I'll address them. Uh, understood. Apologize. Okay. M maybe Mary Beth could explain it through the chair if that's okay. I'm just perplexed. All right. I'm, I'm going to have our attorney answer that. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for the committee tonight, but I'll certainly be in touch with the um, Okay. Thank you. The state. Anybody else for public input? Good evening, uh, Rich Saborn, 65 Old Lyman Road. Our neighborhood is affected by the narrow intersection that presently is a one-way street to provide safe access for vehicles and pedestrian traffic. We wish to keep it that way. Prior to being a one-way street, surveys showed 2,500 cars traveling through the residential street per week mostly as a cut through to Westover Air Force Base and the industrial park. According to Matt's live, the city of Chickabee zoning board has approved in a Westover Air Park on Griffin Road, a 152,000 square foot building with 238,000 square feet of outside storage for UFI industries to build wooden building trusses, adding 100 new employees and working until 2.30 a.m. This company is moving from Belchertown and no doubt will add much more cut through traffic to the neighborhood if the one way is discontinued. The cost of the city so far in a one way sign, the cost of the city so far is a one way sign. Given the recent number of pedestrian fatalities in Chicopee and the city's new awareness of pedestrian safety, the one way street should remain intact as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else for public input? I don't we do mind. Right? Stan, why don't you use the mic over here? Use the mic over here. No, you got to use the mic over here. Use the mic. No. No. Hey, let him run his meeting. Stan, use the. Okay, thank you, Stan. Uh, Stan Walls Act 33, La Riviere Drive. Okay. Reason for the description is Could I want to make sure. Mic? Could you speak into the mic, please? The people on Zoom are not going to be able to hear you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. The reason for the uh, description of the uh, ordinance, I want to make sure people are clear as to what is, is actually taking place. So, so this is the, this is the ordinance to have the one way street <clears throat> from Old Lyman, uh, Anson Street going straight up to Britain, Britain Street. And at this point in time, uh, what I wanted to point out was the particular width of the street at this point. So at the beginning of Anson where the ordinance starts, the width of the street is 36 feet wide at house number one. House two and three, the road stays at 36 feet wide. And then continue up to four and five houses, the width of the street stays at 36 feet wide. And then we have that indentation in the road where it's 16 feet, okay? And then after that, at house number six, the road goes up to 24 feet, and then at the end of the street, it's 28 feet. Okay, the reason I brought that to your attention was uh, the portion of this uh, road uh, apparently is not safe because it doesn't meet the State De uh, Department of Transportation requirement. Of, uh, because of the archaic uh, indentation here. It's only 16 feet. It's supposed to be at least 22 feet. So my question was because uh, the majority of the street exceeds the DOT requirement, 
36, 36, 24, 28. The only section that is not compliant is this indentation. So my question is, is there any reason why this part of the street cannot be fixed? And as everyone knows, the mayor has indicated that he would like safe streets initiative applied throughout the whole Ward 9. And basically he's saying that if there's a street that is archaic or lacks the proper street safety, he wants to know about it and he wants it fixed. That's what he's been telling us. And so it's up to- I'll take your three minutes are up. Oh. Sorry, I'm eliminating it to three minutes to everyone in the audience. Okay, thank you. Anybody else for public input? Can you leave the map, please? I mean, you don't have to. Yeah, okay. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Gagnon, 53 Old Lyman Road, Chicopee. That's not a timer? great representation of what the street looks like. I don't know what this. The indentation is not like a half a half a donut. It's the entire street. Like you guys are all familiar with it. This the horse is as dead as dead can be. It, but it doesn't look anything like that. If it did, then yeah, the plows would have taken that out, theoretically. Like anybody could. That's not what the street looks like. If if widening it is what needs to be done, doesn't sound cheap. I mean, if the taxpayers that are against this proposal or, or want to make it two-way want to chip in for that, then great. But I don't think it should be put on the burden of the city. The street should be a one-way street. There are dozens and dozens of one-way streets around the city that have been mitigated by police and fire and things like that. This is such a minor issue that's been just talked about so much. Uh, I'm fully in support of keeping it a one-way street. I've lived there for 10 years now. The neighborhood's never been quieter. The, the, I am as, as impacted as anybody to get home from places, and the 20, 30 seconds it takes to go around has not bothered me at all. I understand why people, you know, every, nobody likes change, but I just the map bothered me, and I wanted to bring up that doesn't look like that. And I actually don't know where those numbers came from. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Anyone else for public safety? Hey, Vaseline, 147 Dean Street in Chicopee. The only reason this issue came to life, it was the very beginning, measured by a civil engineer that it was way too short and then it became nothing but an inconvenience for people, and then petitions started. And there was a petition that, that circulated with 98 names on it, wanting it to go back to a two-way. Today I have a petition with 153 names, wanting it to stay. That's 150% more. They want it to stay a one-way. The problem is the traffic. The 450 cars a day that would go by my house, and it is true. UFI that is going to relocate is going to have two or 300 more cars. And exponentially, this traffic is going to be absurd. It's about the safety for the kids in the neighborhood. It's safety for the people that walk this neighborhood. And that's really what it's all about. We've been told that the ambulances wouldn't be able to get there. That is absolutely not true. I have GPSs from the station just a few miles from us where ambulances can get there in less than three minutes. Those ambulances will not even travel that way. We've been told that, well, potentially we could have some come from South Hadley. The same very thing. GPSs bring you right down Blanchard Street. They never go to this one way. So that is absolutely not true, and I want to dispel that. Anyone can check it with their own GPS on their phone or on their cars. So the problem here is children. The problem here is we got a safe neighborhood, and we want to keep it. Thank you. Anybody else for public input?
have two comments. One. Um, Would you give your name and address, oh, sorry. please? Judy Fratamico, 28 La Riviera Drive. Um, if my concern from the beginning of this was safety in an emergency, and I drove it. It takes more than 30 seconds for um, a car, an emergency vehicle. It's fine if their GPS tells them to go the other way. Um, you have four to six minutes when you have cardiac arrest before you have brain damage. Most people don't know CPR. Um, I'm a nurse. I've done CPR in a hospital, in a doctor's office, and on the sidewalk outside medical. Um, you need somebody there quickly. House is on fire. I don't know how much time you have. That was my only concern about changing that in terms of safety. How much longer are we going to wait? And we can't be sure the ambulance is going to come from South Hadley. The other thing <clears throat> is that the way this happened sure. is still an issue in the neighborhood. I've had conversations with Mary Beth about it. I'm not sure it can be fixed now, but it's been a neighborhood divided. I've only lived there three or four years. I'm sorry to see that. Um, it was done in secrecy, people think. Um, and they were surprised to find out. They found out, oh, we have a one way now. So there's that issue. I don't know if you can repair that. I don't know if that can be repaired. Um, the issue of the emergency vehicles, I think that's a big public safety issue. I, I think that more time should be spent on that rather than how many kids are walking. Not that I don't, not that I, I don't want the kids to get hit. Um, I've walked the neighborhood since I moved in. I've never had a problem. Um, my first question at the meeting in July was how did this happen? It's happened. People are not happy. Um, the safety issue for many of us are the emergency vehicles. Thank you. Anybody else for public input? My name is Tom Costello, and I live at 66 Voss Avenue, and I'm Mary Beth's husband. I would just like to address the safety issue here. In the case of an emergency, the police and the fire can do whatever the hell they have to do in order to basically get there. And they can go one way, two ways in an emergency. We recently had a flyer coming out saying they couldn't do that. And what, what amazed me was that one of the people who got the flyer Googled the uh, statute and said you can basically do what you have to do. You have to be careful. So I, I can understand the legitimate concerns of people concerning the ambulances. But in a case of a true emergency, they can go one way, two way. They're not you know, bound by just a sign saying you can't go this way. Thank you. Public input. Sure. Laura Stamborski, 48 Landing Drive. I'm also perplexed by what my personal business and Martin Street, which is off of Pendleton, has to do with this issue, but I guess that'll be resolved later. So for now, I'll just stick to the script. First, I'd like to bring up a memo from April of last year in which the original recommended solution was a no parking on both sides of the section. Then, according to the memo, Councilor Costello and the city engineer met in the field and determined the proposal was no longer the preferred solution. It says several solutions were discussed, including widening the road and creating a dead end. It goes on to state that creating a dead end creates problems for emergency response. This is a memo. So that was not a preferred solution. However, by establishing the one way, they have blocked emergency services, which my recollection of the July 19th meeting, both police and fire said that by policy, they will not go through the one way. So they have blocked emergency services from coming through there. So why is DPW now in favor of a solution that blocks emergency response when in the past they were not? I'm sure many people, I'm sure like many of us, they didn't know that and we didn't know that. But once that was found out, I feel like that sign should come down immediately because it's not true that it takes 30 seconds. From where I live, it's a full two minutes to go all the way around. Okay. Next, I think many of us would agree that the width of a road is not the only thing to take into consideration when determining if a one-way should be established. 
especially in a city like ours where there are many narrow streets and imperfect roadways. In fact, there are many documented articles from transportation engineering sources that state one-way streets are typically used in high volume situations, which this is not, typically done in couplings with the next entry point never being over a quarter mile, which it is. The next entry point to the neighborhood is almost double that at almost half a mile. And traffic circulation in a broader area must be carefully considered before converting, which it was not as evidenced by the testimonies here today and the multitude of increased safety concerns as caused. Additionally, we have not been able to find anything that says a one way does anything but increase traffic speed. Many areas are converting back to two way, including Chicopee, and narrow roads are actually used frequently as a traffic calming method. I would also like to mention pedestrian safety. I know that this is a large and necessary topic of conversation these days in the city as it should be. And all of us want pedestrian safety. However, many of us feel that the new one way has made it much less safe for a far larger number of homes, children, and pedestrians in our neighborhood by forcing traffic onto Britain, Blanchard, Anson, and others. Those are all wider roads where cars can more easily speed and have been. Pedestrian safety has been compromised exponentially because of this new one way. This was not an issue for safety when this street was two way. In fact, if we recall the DPW data, their traffic data from prior to the one way shows that the amount of traffic was in the good and very close to excellent range based on public measures of acceptable traffic. Additionally, 85% of the traffic through that section, according to that data, is not speeding, and the average speed is 18 miles per hour. None of those statistics are problematic and do not indicate a safety issue of any sort. Just three minutes are up. I'm up. I talked yeah. as fast as I could. Thank you. I just asked a question. I'd like to submit all of this for public record. This is the data that backs up and it's nice set in here. Very good. Thank you. I also have emails from several people that weren't able to make it tonight but wanted their information shared. What, no, no. what can I do with that? You can turn in the emails to us if you like. Public record? Sure. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure it gets into the folder. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Can you speak into the mic, please? I, I dare say I am the oldest living property owner of that area. The city has made mistakes in the past. When I was a kid, a truck, large tanker truck, go down the street spraying oil through a hundred ports, hundreds of gallons on Anton Street to pack it. Kind of dangerous. Two people I know have had wells. My father had a well to water garden. Back in the day, a large tanker truck with a spraying device would go down the street, spraying the woods with a 20 foot diameter spray of insecticide. Think that hurt anybody? City mistake? Yes. I have, since this started, I saw the thing across Blanchard Street there counting the traffic. I went there for the first time to that corner. And even as I sat there, a car across the street stopped. I stopped to make a left turn on Britain. The car waited. Okay, I went, looked in the mirror. The car went through the one way. Since then, I went there many times at night. Sat there. Every time I went there, I observed multiple cars going through the one way. I observed cars coming up to the stop sign slowly, turning off their lights and going through the one way. I put it to you that this is a mistake. The city made an unsafe condition. I'm putting the city on notice that you now know the city created an unsafe condition. I'm sure a good law firm could hold the city responsible. Okay? That is, when it was, it was a road to 90 Anson Street, going up the hill was a dirt road, two tire tracks, strip of grass in the middle. Many times cars have come up, people knew how to pull over, let cars by. So in 60, Three years or so, of my knowledge, the one way has never been a problem. Most people walk, they walk on the wide streets doing the circle on Dean Street and Anson Street. Not many people walk up and down that area of Old Lyman Road. <clears throat> up the mile, there's been no problems. It's, I just looked at it. Okay.
things need to be done. You're talking about 900 to 1,000 square feet of altering a road, about the size of someone's driveway. This is 28 feet here, uh, halfway, three quarters of the way into 65 property. It's 28 feet. So you're talking here, here, less than 1,000 square feet. Pretty easy solution. Fire hydrant, telephone pole, there's room. I just took dozens of measurements, okay? Uh, Bass was a dirt road. Three minutes are up Dean there. Street was a dirt road. The next street over didn't exist. Thank you very much, sir. Your three minutes are up. Anybody else for public input? It's not on stage. My name is Marie Aslin. I live at 147 Dean Street. I've lived there for 30 plus years. <clears throat> And I've always said at the last meeting, it depends where you live. It's how you are affected by the street. Granted that there is a narrowing at the beginning, which makes it very skinny. So by the time they accelerate, they're coming up over this hill, going down at a greater speed. As it starts to turn around in front of my home on 147 Dean Street, I've, I've been there for 30 plus years. They've driven into my rock wall. They've knocked down my mailbox. They've driven over my lawn. And so they're not just going 18 miles an hour. Trust me, they're going 30 to 35 miles an hour. They're speeding around there and then they speed around La Riviere Drive. One day I was home and this woman was flying up La Riviere Drive and smashed into a telephone pole because she couldn't make the turn. And I had to go out there to make sure she was live. So on my corner, I see a lot. I see a lot of ambulances on Dean Street. I also went and spoke to a lot of people within the area that are exposed to the high traffic, and they don't like that high traffic. So if you live down the cul-de-sac, you're not going to get the traffic by. And people I spoke to at the end of Dean Street, where I live, say that they didn't even know that this traffic existed. On top of that, they say, is it a hindrance for this one way for for ambulances services. So I said, well, for the before and after this one way became into effect, I've seen ambulances come and go. I've seen so many ambulances down Dean Street. So it doesn't matter either way. On top of that, I was kind of curious. So I put in my GPS. Yep, I put in my GPS. I said, what route would the South Hadley Fire Department um, at District 1 or 2, what route would they take? I was curious. Do they all? I was told they always come down Old Lyman Road. So I thought, well, that doesn't make sense why they would always come down Old Lyman Road because we have a wonderful fire department not far. So I went down there, put a GPS, put my address in. It was four to five minutes. So I went to the South Hadley Fire Department and I sat there, I put my GPS and that was eight to nine minutes. And you know what? They came down Memorial Drive. They took a left on Britain Street, to, took a right on Blanchard Street, and you could make it to any destination you wanted to. And not one of those GPSs made it through the one way. They never came through. I went to Center Street down in Ludlow. That one brought you up on the turnpike to get to their fastest destination. So as it stands now, if any ambulance services, if they have to use the outside services, like from Granby or South Hadley, and they're not familiar with the area, they're going to put it in their GPS, and it's going to go down Britain Street, Blanchard, and to their destinations. That's just what I have to say. I see a lot from my corner, and trust me, I was tired of people running into my home, into my property, because they're going way too fast. And 80 to 90 percent of the traffic thank, thank you very much. Anybody else for public input? Hi, my name is Sandra Shagnon. I live on 34 Blanchard Street. I've been there for 60 years. Um, I have to say that I understand everybody's you know, position in this, but that street for 60 years that I've known has always been um, a cut through. Um, I have used it. My son lives on Anson Street, so we go there that way. Um, but what I see is I understand where they're living and, and they don't like the traffic. But now I can be honest with you as living there for 60 years, all that traffic is being now rerouted re onto Blanchard Street, and they don't go 25 or 30. I'm not kidding you when I tell you they go 50 or 60 down that street. 
And because it's wider and there's more, um, you know, space to go, they do. Whereas whether that one way is, at least they have to slow down because it does narrow. So I don't think you fixed this problem. I think you've just moved it to another location. And what I want to say is that maybe we need to do something on Blanchard Street. Maybe put some speed bumps in. Maybe put one of those signs to show the speed. I mean, I want to work with everybody here. And maybe if we got together before all this hit, the neighbors could have got together and came up with, hey, maybe we had to do a one-way for certain hours. Or maybe we could um, you know, put a little light there to see how many... Uh, you know, people are going through, but we wake up one day, we go down the street and there's a do not enter sign. And I'm like, what, what just happened? So I think that we shouldn't be standing here trying to fight to take it down. You got, they should be working on trying to put it up, but now we are the ones that have to come and plead our case. And um, I just don't think it was done the right way. I know legally speaking, you didn't have to tell us, you didn't have to do that because that's what the law says. Morally and ethically, I think you need to consult everybody that is involved. And that's all I have to say, and I hope they change it. Thank you. Anybody else for public input? Hi, uh, Sean Goonan, 6 Lincoln Street. Uh, I don't live in that neighborhood, um, but I'd like to talk about. Uh, road safety and pedestrian safety in general, and also touch on that neighborhood as well. It's uh, item number three on the agenda. Don't have a it's item number three. Oh, so we're not talking about that we'll right now? We'll do public input on that as well. That'll be okay. the third item, Mr. Gunan. The third, will third there be public input for that? Yeah, third okay. item. I'll tie it in. This is strictly for Old Lyman Road. <laughs> Anybody else for Old Lyman Road? I'll give you a chance. Going once. Oh, there we go. I am Tim Prez. I'm at 17 Landing Drive. Um, I just want to thank you guys for listening to everybody's viewpoints here. Um, and <clears throat> clearly the, the neighborhood's been divided. Um, I don't envy you your job at all. Um, I mean, in reality, when this first came up, the majority of the neighborhood was really, uh, I believe, misrepresented. You know, one person sat up here and said, it's good with all the neighbors, which really didn't have that data. Um, since then, there was a, you know, a petition that had so many names to it, then another petition that had so many names to it, and everybody's trying to kind of one-up each other on this argument. Um, <clears throat> but I personally, you know, I don't see the data that supports other than, you know, um, an interpretation of some measurements that are put out by the state. And there's a few different measurements from what I understand that, um, that can be referenced there. Um, just for the record, I'm against the one way. Um, I don't see any incidences that were on the record that had, you know, any accidents, any pedestrian incidents. Um, you know, not like say Willamancet where they're clearly on the record and, uh, there's a lot of pedestrian incidences down there. So, uh, I'm against the, uh, I'm against the one way. Thank you. So as, as you can hear, there's a lot of pro and con on this please? issue. Excuse name me. Name and address, please. Uh, my name is David Ferraro. I live on 124 Dean Street. You're welcome. There's a lot of pro and con on this issue. One of the benefits from making it one way is it has reduced traffic for some neighbors in one section for a degree. But I believe, I agree with the Shagnon woman. All they've done is move it to a different section. And it's gotten busier on Britain Street, and it's gotten busier on Blanchard Street. So that's not even a consideration. The reason the road was changed to one-way street was for a, an immediate safety action, because as my understanding is, two school buses had a very slight kiss, some sort of minor side swipe. Now, obviously, when you're driving school buses that big, if you can't see on that road, there ain't enough room for two vehicles, and you don't have enough courtesy to stop and let one vehicle pass, I can't help you. I've been there 35 years and that has never been a problem that road. 
how it's been able to go this long is probably because it was grandfathered in when the road was built. It seems to me the city maintains a 10 foot tree belt on most streets that they install. There should be room to widen that road. And I don't understand why there wouldn't be. And it seems to me that's the common sense approach to this is to make the road a little bit wider. Make it a one way I think is a mistake. I'd also like to hear from representatives uh, from the fire and the police. I think they ought to address this room as to if there's emergency calls, would they go against the, the regular flow of traffic, especially on that road where you come up a grade and as you're coming up the grade, there's, your view is obscured a little bit before you come to the other part of the road. Uh, there's a safety issue there. And if you're gonna leave it so emergency vehicles can come up against that one way, there needs to be another sign to inform motorists that. Today, you have where emergency vehicles go down the road like Memorial Drive or whatever, most of these vehicles have a switch and they throw the sensors and it throws all the traffic lights red in all directions. This was done because of accidents and things that have happened. I've never seen a police cruiser go south on the north side of Route 33 or vice versa. If they're in an emergency call, they're going with the flow of traffic. So I think both the police and the fire really should address the room because I'd like to hear the answers as to whether or not they can go in an emergency situation against that flow of traffic. And what if there's an oncoming car and there's a head-on collision there? What's the liabilities for the city there? So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anybody else for public input? Peter Stamborski, um, again, I'll be quick, Landing Drive. I'm all for other options that help people like Marie Aslin and Dave Aslin. They're great people, good neighbors. If people are speeding around that curve, the data doesn't reflect that in here. And I totally appreciate and respect what they're saying. People walk through this neighborhood, two, three people wide with their dogs. The only dry, uh, sidewalk is on Laravere, and it's very rare you'll see anyone walk there. But again, as our leaders in our community, please pull us together and stop this fighting that we have going on. It's horrific. This is a great neighborhood. If you prioritize safety concerns in the city, this area would be very low on anyone's radar. And anybody in the audience would have to agree with that. It's, it's, I could show you pictures and this has just been just handled very horribly for the neighborhood. And I think there's a lot of tension on both sides. So again, I'm happy with all the neighbors that we have. We're sick of fighting about this. Nobody ever wanted to fight about it. It just didn't come about the right way. And instead of us banging heads, fighting over one way, no one way, if you want to widen the road, don't widen it too much so people are going fast like they do on others, but maybe you put a um, safety hump in front of their house. Your you know? time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else for public input? I'm going to close it out now and open it up to the speakers that I have to have questions, certain things that are going on. Well, public input is done right now. Yeah, well, you no, that, not you right now. Uh, I, I want to hear from our Department of Public Works superintendent on this whole issue, Ms. Liz Batista. Good evening. So, uh, I don't know if this one is working really well. Uh, I just want to address some of the comments that were made first um, regarding uh, some technical interpretations, I guess. Is this working really well? Hello? Okay. So, as a DPW superintendent, the engineering department falls under my purview. And... No. I'll, I'll, get, I'll bring it over here. As a DPW superintendent, I uh, oversee the engineering department. Um, I am a licensed PE. Doug Ellis, city engineer, is a licensed PE, and we take our job very seriously. When this, pro uh, this issue was presented to the engineering department, there was a question about um, speeding 
and whether or not uh, vehicles can safely travel through this section of road. And initially, it did come up as, I believe, a no parking request uh, to, make, and to ensure that there was space on the road for cars to pass through. But once we went out there, it was found that it is extremely narrow. It's too narrow for two-way traffic. And I understand that there is courtesy style driving where maybe you would stop and let somebody go. But as we know, with the increased use of technology, a lot of people are distracted. And so we take all of that into consideration. We want to make sure that what we decide is safe for everybody. I'm not, I'm not going to you know, argue with police and fire about emergency response. We also worry about that and safety, but primarily we worry about those that are physically using uh, the right of way on a daily basis. So when it was considered, why not make it a dead end? Well, um, police and fire, they're, they're part of a site plan review committee for the city. So when we have developments, you actually can't put in dead ends without either a cul-de-sac at the end or a T because you need to be able to leave that road safely. So if a fire truck is coming down, they need to be able to turn around. And on true dead ends, that's very difficult. So they end up having to just back up. And I, I think that that's accurate, right? When we, when we review projects, they have to have some kind of means of turning around. So the dead end there, not, not something that we could do because there's not enough real estate in the right of way to put in a cul-de-sac without taking people's property. To make it safe at that moment would be to put, was to make it a one way. And so although notification didn't go out to everybody in the neighborhood, because in reality, it is written that we, you, know, you, you notify a budding, directly abutting property owners. You don't notify everybody that may utilize this road. But as I said, we had a meeting with uh, myself, the fire chief, police chief, um, Doug Ellis, the city engineer, uh, city council president, Mary Beth, and uh, uh, Bob Zigorowski, we met and we talked about it. We all talked about it and we all agreed that we were going to leave it as a one way until we could make a decision on whether or not the city would uh, appropriate funds to widen the street. To go back to... Um, it's hard for somebody who doesn't deal with this type of pro type of work on a regular basis, but we can't just go and cut out the grass, take the curb out and pave it and call it a day. That's not how we do road projects. We actually have to go and make sure that all of the pavement is appropriate. You can't just put new pavement next to the old pavement. As we know, when we do that, when we do potholes. They don't last very long. So of course we wouldn't just widen the road simply by ripping out a section um, and expanding the right of way it would have to be a full road reconstruction project to ensure that the investment the city is making is a longer lasting investment, not something that's gonna last for a couple of years and be cracking and breaking apart and coming up with uh, uh, during plowing. Um, let's see, The comment about on-car, uh, the increased likelihood of uh, uh, head-on collision in an emergency, well, that the same thing applies for two-way traffic when you don't have the appropriate lane width for cars to pass by. So it could happen with regular residential vehicles that are driving through there that maybe don't see an oncoming car coming up the hill at maybe an increased speed or coming down the hill. at increase. So these are all the things that we take into account. Also, um, I think the it was misrepresented as the speed through there before the one-way. Um, it's not that the least number of vehicles are going in excess of the speed limit. It's the majority of the vehicles are actually going in excess of the speed limit. Well, please, That's not please let her speak. All right. No comments at all. No. Okay, please. <laughs> um, Go ahead, Ms. So I just want to make it known that we take our, our job seriously. We don't do things because we're not thinking them through and just slapping a Band-Aid on it. It's something that you know we felt that was appropriate at for the current uh, state of the road, and that moving forward, if we decide to widen the road, then we'll widen the road. Um, so I guess that's all I wanted to say um, in regards to this, and that if the city would like to appropriate the money, we would be 
we would design a, a widening of the road. We would. So, and once it's widened and it's appropriately sized, then we couldn't, we can't not agree with the fact that it would be appropriate for two way. You know? So. The, could I ask you one question, Ms. Batista? How much do you think approximately it would cost to make it a two way? I just want to have that figure. So, um, if we were to do a full depth road reconstruction on that section of road, I mean, when we did, for instance, Baskin Drive, granted Baskin Drive is a bit longer than that, but it would probably be in close to half a million dollars. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The cost of, uh, well, the cost of we're not doing this, people. <laughs> you know, that's what we're seeing what's bidding right now. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else along this table? Doug, you all set? All set? But Chief, you have any comment on this? Yeah, I, I just want to say that uh, when we've gone through these meetings before, I've spoken with uh, I've spoken with some of the residents. As as I brought up before, I also live in that neighborhood. I live at 104 Dean Street, so I'm familiar with the area. Been there for about 12 years. Um, when Chief Stamborski and I were were referencing that, our, we're not going to allow our vehicles to go down a, a, a one way, the wrong way. It's for a specific reason. We don't want to incur liability upon the city. We don't want to incur liability upon our officers. That for uh, for that reason, it's a, a matter of policy that we don't encourage it. Mr. Costello, you could be 100% right as far as it being allowed through the law. But if I can bring up an instance, we're allowed to chase people on the roadways. And as everybody in this room is aware, we normally don't chase people anymore unless it's a very serious felony for the reason that the officers that are initiating the chase are found responsible if those vehicles get into accidents. It would be no different if we were chasing somebody up that runway, uh, one way section and a crash occurred. We would be held responsible for that. That's not a. a a debt that I want to incur on myself, my officers, or the city. That's that's my biggest concern. And as far as uh, Chief Stamborski's concern about the ambulance response times, I'm not going to speak to that directly, but I would agree with him on that. If he had concerns about response times for people in the neighborhood that might be experiencing cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest, I would want to make sure that the ambulance was able to get there as quickly as possible. Again, I don't refute what you folks say, as far as the GPS, I'm sure you're probably 100% right. I can't speak to how they're gonna go though, if you understand that. Does anybody else have any questions for me? No, that's through okay. the chair. Sorry. Through sir. the chair, that's okay. Are you all, no, go mm -hmm. ahead, through the chair, go ahead. Your question. Not that I'm aware of as far as accidents. Is that what you're speaking of, yeah. sir? The only one that I'm aware of um, was the, the school bus incident, which wasn't a reported accident. It was two vehicles that slid on ice, I believe, and barely touched mirrors. Thank you. All right, you got your answer, okay? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. But go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, no, sir. I just checked. We have had no accidents. I ran it just from the start of this year. There's been uh, no accidents reported, and I believe four citations have been issued just at the intersection of uh, Old Lyman and Britton Street. That's not including the other side streets in the area. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Uh, listen, I want, I want to get some of the other people. Uh, you're representing the fire chief, uh, Captain. Okay. Any comments? Go ahead, Counselor, if I could add just one more thing, uh, in, in regards to the safety aspect too, um, since it has become a one way, I, I guess that I travel, I live that area, I have to go out um, Blanchard Street up to Britain, and I brought it up to Mr. Bowyer before, um, and I'm not picking on a resident that's at the corner there, but they do have a fence here. You have to kind of creep out a little bit onto Britain Street from Blanchard, and the cars that are coming from the old Lyman Road turning onto Blanchard Street, you're making an offset angle turn. And if there's cars parked against the far curb, it, it makes it a dangerous situation. And I'm not saying that there's been accidents there, but it's a point of concern. 
Thank you, Chief. Um, Mr. Zagorowski, I believe this Hold woman on, on. the first I want, row. I want the fire chief to speak first, oh, the captain's yeah. representative. She the has a chief. question for um, yeah, the police chief. Doing this. We'll, chair. We'll, we'll wait a little while. No, that's one gentleman had a question go and ahead. he was allowed. I just want we'll, to have a chair. Captain Chobar, go ahead. <clears throat> I just told the public to know that the fire chief gave me a call. He's ill tonight and could not make it. So Captain Cobal is taking his place for the time being. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for bearing with me tonight. I haven't been with this um, pr project or issue from the beginning, but I am aware of some of it. Um, so Chief Stamborski remains against Old Lyman Road being a one way as he has been from the beginning of this issue. His underlying reason for his concern is emergency response being delayed by a minute and a half. 90 seconds when mutual aid services are responding from the north, specifically South Hadley or Ludlow. Um, there is data to show that in a residential structure, fire does double in size every 30 seconds. So 90 seconds is a lot when it is a structure fire. Um, most typical one-way street situations do not create this long of a delay because there's another street in close proximity allowing them to circle around. However, there's quite a bit of distance before an emergency vehicle can turn to get to that particular section of the city. And the ambulance or fire truck would have to go all the way down Blanchard to the first possible turn. The chief has asked, been, it has been asked repeatedly why we don't drive the wrong way against the one-way street signage. Um, I personally have never done that. Um, I wouldn't do that, it's against policy because if we were to ever hit another car, um, the liability would be on the city. Um, unless we had police that were blocking traffic and directing us down, and then we would do that. Um, the only, in oh, I said that, sorry. The chief has emails from both the Ludlow um, chief and the South Hadley chief stating they do not go down one-way streets either. The chiefs feel that any delay in emergency response is unacceptable, and this is why Chief Stamborski remains adamant about the road being returned to its two-way status. In the most recent meetings with DPW, City Council, Police Chiefs, Attorney Garvey, the chief has suggested that perhaps the city widens that small portion of the road, which was discussed earlier tonight. Um, as a resident who has resided at 78 Old Lyman for several years with his young sons, that particular section of road always acted like a natural road diet, slowing down the traffic because it is narrow. If pedestrian safety remains a concern, then perhaps a sidewalk could be installed. Um, this is what um, Chief Stamborski asked me to present at the meeting tonight. Um, I can try and handle any questions that anyone has, but again, um, this isn't my project or, you know, I haven't been involved in this since the get-go. Thank you, Captain. Uh, Councilman Dobes, do you have any questions? But Councilman Balak here. Not at this time, thank you. I've been asked to take about a three minute recess and I'm gonna ask for a roll call on that. Somebody needs to. The, the woman or, still has yeah. her. Uh, Coming right we'll back. We'll get to it Coming after, right Ms. Lope, uh, Ms. Costell. Roll call for a three minute recess. Councilor Zigorowski? Yes. Roy? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Labrie? Yes. Couchet? Yes. There's old timers. I'm going like this. You move over. <laughs> She's just going. I know that feeling. I've been there. Did he want that? Same size as this. I look at him like. I'm keeping the service on that point. One question each. I 
A motion, I'll put it down. We'll have the vote on a motion for the ordinance. Eventually, that's what we'll do. Once I, once I close, you know what happened on that one. All right. Well, we still have to Then we'll make a decision. So we just need to refer to the ordinance. You're right. And we'll do it. Okay. Well, don't you make a recommendation to them? Yeah. But you want to, you know, they want to take it. Back. So what I'm saying is, she wants to do a whole street. I can see not doing just that spot, but what if you go 50 feet in each direction and make it one really nice shot? Should we, should we take it? 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 Should we Oh, and I used to go for a drink after. Wait, so. I, I knew this was going to be. I mean, we've only got, we haven't even got to the I'm going to go back to where I was talking to the people at the desk. Uh, Councilman for Ward 6 had some questions to ask. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a, a brief statement, if that's okay. 
uh, Derek Dobis, Chickabee City Council, Ward 6. Uh, I'm not on this committee, but for the public's uh, benefit, I, I was on, I am on ordinance, uh, and I did vote for the one way when it came up, um, what, a few months ago now, it was quite a while ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to defend my vote, uh, just for the public to understand it's a difficult issue. There's 100 people, over 100 people for it, and over 100 people against it, I understand that. Um, but coming from the ordinance point of view, you know, I don't live in this neighborhood. I did take a drive by. Um, parts of the street are, they just seem too narrow for two-way driving. I understand it's been that way for a long time, um, but our DPW recommended uh, it, it's, it's too narrow. Uh, and truthfully, I do think it's too narrow uh, for safely for two-way driving. Um, I understand there, you know, there could be some emergency vehicle issues. Um, it, it seems like widening the road could be a long-term issue. Um, you know, half a million dollars is a lot of money. Uh, from my understanding, the, the mayor's office indicated that they don't want to do this immediately. Um, I don't want to speak for the mayor's office, but that's what I, that's what I was told. Um, but maybe that's a long-term issue, but, you know, based on what the ordinance committee was told, it's committee. just simply too narrow. Uh, and I want to just defend my vote. I understand some neighbors were mad. They felt that it was done in, in secret. I can tell you that it, you know, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't done in secret. It came to the city council. It was sent to ordinance the fire and then it was sent back to the city council. Um, you know, by ordinance, you know, mailings go out with people who live within so many hundreds of feet. I think it's two or three hundred feet. Maybe our attorney can clarify that. Um, you know, uh, count, well, Councilor Costello has since uh, reviewed that, tried to expand it so that people who live further out would get notified. Um, you know, uh, again, I don't live in that neighborhood. I don't, I don't know who should have been notified. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty well known in the city for being anti-establishment. Uh, you know, uh, and so I just wanted the public to understand that, you know, I didn't do anything in secret. Uh, I don't live in this area, but I voted for the one way because I feel it's too narrow and I still feel it's too narrow. Uh, of course, we're concerned about emergency vehicle time uh, and things like that. Uh, I think they should adjust the best they can and hopefully we can find some long term solutions. Um, if we can narrow, if we, if we can widen the road long term, uh, maybe that's the solution. Uh, but I just wanted to defend my vote. I, I personally feel parts of the road are too narrow for two-way street, for a two-way car, two-way traffic, excuse me. Um, but maybe we can find a long-term solution that, that works a little bit better. Uh, and if, if there's a lot of traffic issues on, on Blanchard or uh, Britain Street, then I, you know, I support the speed bumps. I support the speed bumps on Front Street. Uh, I support them for areas of my ward. Uh, I would support them in this area as well if there's traffic issues in other parts of the ward. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor? Listen, one, one second, one, one, one second. Uh, our city engineer, uh, I had a few people ask questions. Could you please give us your perspective on this? Good evening, Doug Ellison, the city engineer. As uh, Elizabeth Tisa had come, the superintendent had come before, you know, when we were first asked to investigate it, it was, you know, no parking issue. And when I took some measurements, realized that the road is only 16 feet wide. It's not wide enough for two-way traffic. So we conferred and uh, suggested to the ordinance committee that we uh, consider a one-way. And then the ordinance committee did, and the city council did approve that as a one-way. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Ms. Costello, go ahead. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, it's nice of you to take the time. I, f I feel that this road should have been discussed a long time ago. And we should have avoided even though it wasn't reported by the, to the police, it was reported to the school department in regards to December 11, 2019, where there was a school bus incident because of ICE, okay? But it happened, and it happened on a narrow street. What happened before in regards to reviewing this road should have happened, and then we wouldn't be here tonight with anger. And I can understand your anger, and I appreciate that anger because you're passionate about what you're doing, and that's a good thing. That shows that democracy in this city is working. We don't agree on how this can happen and how this plays out, but that's the way life works. We're not always going to be in agreement. And sometimes through disagreement, 
we can come up with a excellent solution. Making sure that that road is safe. I can tell you from personal experience, I had a daughter tell me after she had a jump out of the way of two cars on Old Lyman Road, jump. Luckily, she didn't get injured, didn't roll her foot, had a jump. She came back home and said, I was on the school committee at the time, and she said to me, Mom, how can the city allow to have a street like this? Why are we allowing this? Well, tonight, we're trying to resolve it. Well, that leads up. All right. Are you all set, Ms. Costello? I'm just, I'm okay. just thanking them for coming, okay. sharing their viewpoints, and trying to resolve a problem. Because in all fairness, the DPW superintendent and the city engineer have indicated that the road isn't safe. So where do we go from here? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Costello. Now, uh, I have given everybody a chance. I'm gonna allow the audience to have one more uh, question. Just a couple of minutes, please. Don't drag it on, all right? So just get your name and address again if I missed you on the last. Go ahead. Go Two, ahead. Minute. Two minutes, man. Two minutes. Hi, my name is Kathy Bennett. I live on St. Jake's Avenue, but my son lived on the corner of Old Lyman Road in, in Britain Street, and my grandchildren were involved in that bus accident. It wasn't minor. They were stuck together. My grandchildren were on the bus for over two hours. They missed two hours of school. They, we had to wait. We couldn't even get them off the bus because we were right on the corner. We saw the whole thing. And the superintendent the principal, the nurse, everybody had to come and check the kids out. Thankfully, nobody was injured, but it wasn't this minor incident that everybody is regarding to, because I was there, I saw it. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience that has a question first? Go ahead, Mr. Walzak. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Stan Walzak, 33 La Riviere Drive. I just have uh, one question. Um, on the minutes of August 30th, 2022, which is an official record, public record, and, and I just want to clarify this because there seems to be some confusion. Uh, Councilor Roy, and this I'll just read it from the, from the minutes. Councilor Roy asked why Old Lyman Road could not be widened. And city engineer Doug Ellis replied, that there is no reason why it can't be widened. That's what he stated. There is no reason why it can't be widened. Okay. Let me also point out that I've worked with Doug Ellis when I was the city councilor in Ward 9. We did a number of streets that were reconstructed for the city in Ward 9. If you look at that chart, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to mention College Street, Moncom Street, Buckley Boulevard, Thero Drive. Uh, there's a couple others. These were all streets that we worked with DPW to get better, okay, to make sure that the street that was not only widened, resurfaced, and had the appropriate safety signage on each one of those, and it works. We could fix that one. All those, we could fix Old Lyman Road. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walzak. Any, anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, that, where, where we got? Go ahead, Mr. Goonan. Name and address, please. Yeah, Sean Goonan, 6 Lincoln Street. Uh, I have walked in that neighborhood three times, in every street, so I am familiar with it. And uh, I had a question if road narrowing was being considered for both Blanchard Street and Old Lyman, because I think there is an issue with Old Lyman being 16 feet wide. It does encourage people to go the wrong way and try and sneak by they can get away with it if it was 12 feet wide or 11 feet wide there'd still be enough uh width or 12 feet wide enough width for pedestrians and one way while preventing people from wanting to just cut through because it'd be, it'd be more embarrassing to be totally stopped by a car rather than just get by easily if they're small enough but uh for blanchard street uh, a resident mentioned that people now use blanchard street and speed down that street so i think for the entire neighborhood, uh, you know, maybe 
road narrowing would be a uh, consideration for those streets um, because there's not a lot of parked cars on Blanchard Street and it's really wide and it causes speeding. So I think the main issue here is that there's a speeding issue across in that neighborhood. I'll, I'll just talk about that neighborhood for now. Oh. Thank you. Anyone else? Last time, go ahead, two minutes. Name and address, please. John Bogdanovich, 34 Anson Street. I went there this afternoon and took extensive measurements of the area. Thank you very There's much. The hill, cars, the girl said that happens on two way streets too. One way street, the car is going to go down the middle of the street. It's not going to tend to hug to one side. That's why it'd be easier if it'd be a head on collision. Or it wouldn't match with the head. Your time is up now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Good anybody, luck. anybody else for a second time? Go ahead. You got two minutes. Sorry, I'm not going to get into great detail, but I just wanted to say, and this is not scripted, so forgive me if I trip over my words, but Could the situation, I'm again? sorry, Laura Stamborski, 48 Landing Drive, the situation that, that's been created is so upsetting and disheartening, you have no idea. My son was home from college, went down the wrong way accidentally. I've done it a couple times myself. I've been driving that way 20 years, and sometimes you go on autopilot. He was attacked in the road by a visitor to one of the people on Old Lyman to the point where he was banging on the hood of his car, banging on the window. We had, he called 911. We had to call the police, right? There's now a, a, a suit going on because of it. And the gentleman then proceeded from the whole son Old Lyman to follow him home the wrong way down Old Lyman, okay, to our house where luckily we were home and my son kept his wits about him and stayed in the car, called 911, honked his horn when he got there. So that's one incident. Second one is that gentleman, like he just said, was accosted. OK, and then I have received email after email from neighbors saying that they have witnessed the people who live on Old Lyman driving the wrong way, um, backing into their driveways. I haven't personally I, I do have a video of one of the people living there driving the wrong way. And then one of my neighbors told me yesterday she just saw another person driving the wrong way down one way. The people that that asked for this are not obeying the law. So if it is so important to them and it, as a safety issue, why are they not sticking to it themselves and why are we? who are just trying to stick up for ourselves and being treated like we're doing something wrong when we're not. I have never said anything that was untruthful and I am so upset by the way that I'm being treated in my own neighborhood right now. Thank you very much, I understand. <laughs> Anybody else for a two minute rebuttal? Is that it? Okay, I'm gonna close public input now and it's gonna come back to our committee right here for a discussion on this. Although before I do that, I did get a letter and I got to add it into the record. I spoke to our attorney about it from somebody that was against the one way street and Old Lyman Road. Uh, it was from a Mr. Maura David Gerard. Is he here? And a Dennis Disormier and a Maureen Disormier from Blanchard Street. I just got to read it for the record. Oh, not it. Okay. All right. But for the record, I have to read this uh, per our attorney. Hello, my family owns three houses on Blanchard Street and are among the first residents in the neighborhood when only a few homes existed. We are against the one-way sign. I watched the entire meeting from July 19th where many facts were given, and in our opinion, the one-way does not make it safer. Making Lyman one-way is simply rerouting the traffic for Blanchard, Anson, Dean, Larivere, Landon, or Voss to now use Blanchard Street. So our traffic, which impacts many more houses, has been increased. The narrow road has never been an issue and actually decreases speed. 
I feel for the houses near or around 78 Old Lyman Road who are not happy, but they purchased the house understanding their closeness to the streets and the tightness of the location. I just want to put that into the record. Now, uh, we're going to have a discussion amongst our own committee. Okay. Go ahead and slow fast. Thank you. Um, so the counselors and I on the committee have heard all of you today and thank you all for being here. We do agree with Councillor Costello that this is part of the process and all of you should be here um, fighting for your own neighborhood. Unfortunately, only a couple of things can happen from this table. And so I wanna break that down for you very quickly after conversing with, a, with our attorney. We can place it on file and it dies here. We can ask for an appropriation from the mayor um, which we do believe is a little inappropriate at this time because the mayor needs to review. Um, or we can have a motion to send it to the mayor's office for a full cost analysis from the DPW of the cost that it would be to widen the road to be presented to the full council. Another thing we can do is send it to ordinance committee, which I will not be making that motion at this point because we're just going to have the same conversation at the ordinance committee and then another motion will need to be made. And it's kind of pointless to have you keep coming back without an actual solution at hand. So the motion that I'm going to be making at this time is to send it to the mayor's office for a full cost analysis from the DPW of the cost to widen the road to be presented to the full council. Um, I'm making that motion. If you will second it, please. I'd like to hear from some of our Oh yeah, we, we'll, co we'll comment on the motion. <laughs> so can you second it so I can make a second. comment? Perfect, all right. So on that motion, and then we all can speak on the motion. Um, I, we are not sure um, what the cost is. However, it has been discussed that that may be an option. Um, none of us, by, by saying yes to this motion, are agreeing that we will pay that money uh, for the appropriation if it comes before us. Uh, it's not taking a side on this situation. You know, we've heard from both sides today in a pretty equal amount. Um, there were representatives for both sides. And so instead of taking a side at this point, I don't like to take sides on decisions without hearing the full facts on both ends. And we don't have those full facts unless we have a full cost analysis. So at this time, I am obviously going to be voting yes on the motion that I'm putting forth. And the conversation will continue differently once we have the full numbers of what it would actually cost to widen the road and we can make a more sound decision as a council. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I would Councilman just like Roy. to express my feelings on this. I personally am in favor of widening the road. I go along with Chief uh, Stamborski. Uh, I worked on the ambulance for a number of years and I was on the fire department for 28 years. And I think it's a safety factor. I mean, if the speed is gonna be relevant, uh, then, we, then we put in speed bumps, that's all. Uh, there's gonna be pros and cons on both sides. Uh, there's a lot of heated discussion, but it, it favors one and then it doesn't favor another. So I personally am in favor of widening the road. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Councilman. Yeah, I am also in favor of widening the road. I would not vote either way uh, to keep the one way up or take it down. And I don't think that's uh, gonna be in front of us tonight. I like the motion uh, that Councilor Lopez made. Uh, let the mayor look at it. Let's see what the numbers come back at. Uh, but you know, until we find that it can be widened safely, and uh, you know, then I would be for uh, you know taking the one way away if, if that so comes up to our ordinance committee, which I'm on. Um, so we would take it up at that point. But I think to get the ball rolling and not take any sides because as you know, we've indi everybody's indicated. There's somebody that's got 168 names, 100 names over here. You know, you could stop at, you know, price right and just, you know, have people sign things all day long. But, uh, you know, I, I'd be for, you know, just for widening the road. Uh, I'd like to see it done. And then I think we can safely, uh, you know, do what the ward counselor uh, may do or, you know, uh, if there's an ordinance brought up to the uh, a motion to the ordinance committee, we'll take that up uh, in the ordinance committee. And you're welcome to come back to the public hearing for that ordinance committee meeting. Thank you. Any comment? Mr. Yeah, no, I agree too. I would uh, absolutely say yes to the appropriation of funds to widen the road. Um, I'm sure that road is many, many years since it's been done over. Um, so it probably is time for road. Liz would know better than I, but I imagine it's probably in. The, in Every street in the city is due at this point anyway, but so uh, as a, somebody who works in public safety, I would agree and have to side with the chief that, you know, we have to look at people's lives that are on the line when an emergency happens. So, you know, it's not going to get widened tomorrow. We know that, but let's take the steps to get that going and appropriate that money for the widening of the road. 
Uh, if I may, as Chairman of Public Safety, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. Uh, like some of my fellow counselors said, there's going to be pros and cons on this. But we're going to have a this. This will come before the full council on April 9, April 4th at 6:30 in our chambers uh, auditorium. Just want to let you know what our vote is here tonight. It still has to go before the 13 member council, which will be on April 4th. So I just want you to be aware of it. Uh, saying that, being a police officer for 30 years, and being on the council for 20 years now, and I got to say, I used to live on Old Lyman Road many years ago across from the cemetery. But that was the days when I rode a three wheel bicycle. So that's how long ago it was. It was a horse. But uh, no, it wasn't a horse. But saying that, that land that's over there used to be farmland, I understand, years ago. I remember as a kid, it was just, we used to play in there. But I can understand the dangers of that road. But I just want you to be aware of that. I think I spoke to Ms. Batista about this before. There's going to be some cost, but there's going to be some land taking there when that is done. So I don't want you to know, you might lose, I don't know how many feet. I don't know anything. But there's going to be some land that will have to be taken away from maybe. the property there owners may, there. there so be. I want the neighbors to realize that. So we're going to, I'm going to make, the motion is to send, I have a full cost analysis from the DPW at the cost to widen the road to be presented to the full council. Uh, and they were second that already. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilor uh, Zagorowski. Yeah. Or city president. Yeah, oh, just, okay. just so people know, uh, whatever they decide tonight, we, we have time because there will be nothing done for this season. It's already been planned for the, for the construction of any road repairs for this year. It would be for the spring of next year, unfortunately. Am I correct? Uh, we're, we're, we're all planned Wait, out. If that happens, yeah, it wouldn't. It, so we have some time to work on with the mayor on that, but there is will not be done this year. I just, I just have Thank a you, Mr. I just have a question. Um, ahead, there are some people that want immediate reversal. That's this not happening at this street. time. That's not the that motion not, on the floor. That's, that's, that's not, not the motion on the floor. So I want everybody to understand that. I don't want well, everybody I like, to I actually was going to speak on that right now, so if you okay. just give me a chance, yeah, I'll, I'll address I that. That's why... Many people have come here. Give me a second, I got you. Yeah. Okay. One second. So I actually was just about to address that. So to make clear what is happening here tonight, the road is staying as is for now until we have a full cost analysis. We cannot as a council vote on changing the road to a two way when we are told by the DPW that the road is unsafe to do so at this time. That is why it was converted to a one way. However, the point of asking for this full cost analysis is to see what the numbers would be to change it so that it can be wider. And at that point, when it's widened, then we would have another vote to reverse it to a two way. What I will also say here is a second ago, you all just chuckled at Councillor Cruchane joking around with Councillor Zigorowski, right? And I'll tell you that even those of us at this table, we do not agree on every issue. Most times we don't agree on every issue. And at the end of the day, though, we serve a city that we have to work together to serve. And that is the same way as you with your neighborhood. I urge you to continue to be the good neighbors that you are to each other, to not let an issue like this be so divisive that you no longer have your neighbors back. I urge you to please not attack each other. It is okay to disagree. At the end of the day, we all want safer roads, safer neighborhoods. And at the end of the day, that is what we all want as well. Agreeing or not agreeing, that does not mean you should turn your backs on each other. So this tonight, I hope that at least the fact that we are looking into widening the road relieves some of the stress that is going on because regardless of whether you're for the one way or against the one way, you just want a safer road. So we're looking at all the options. As you go home tonight, please be kind to one another. Roll call, please. Councillor Zagorowski? Yes. Roy? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Labrie? Yes. Cushing? Yes. Five yes. Nobody negative. This will be heard at our council meeting on April 4th. So we'll just take a couple of minutes to clear the audience because I got two more issues on. Thank you very much for coming. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. 
it's, it's always going to be like that. Anything we do, it, somebody's not going to be on the right side of that condition. Or you try to make it up. Exactly. And like I said, in the day I ran for these. You do what's best for the majority, but let's hope we can minimize the impact, the impact on the minority. On the minority. Yeah. But, but you always, yeah. but you can't. But you're still, so, your neighborhood is all you've got. Like, I, I think about mm -hmm. my neighborhood and how like, close we are. Thank you. Sir, how you been? Good. Thanks for both of those. Great clients. I wasn't going to let it go. I wasn't going to let it go. Crack in a window. <laughs> it's hot, right? It's so, hot, right? So, I got 75 degrees. Yes. Roy? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Labrie? Yes. Cushing? Yes. 
Yes. Motion to return to the regular order of business. Roll call. call the return to the regular order of business. Councilor Zagorowski? Yes. Roy? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Labrie? Yes. Cushing? Yes. All right, the next item on the uh, public safety is uh, public safety committee meet with the emergency management director, fire chief, and police chief to discuss disaster, disaster preparedness and what the city has in an inventory. Councilman here? Yep, there we go. Floor is yours, Glenn. So the inventory you're asking about, I gave you guys sheets of what we have in our inventory. If you have any questions on that. I gave you guys a, a table yeah, we, phone we instead of right out. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm going to have Councilman Roy uh, you got one? This first. Okay. You got one? Sure. Yeah, the reason I asked to have you all invited, these are these are trying times for the whole nation. Rather have us be prepared for something that hasn't happened than say, why weren't we prepared for it ahead of time? Whether it's a natural disaster or otherwise. I mean, we're, we're probably as closer than we've ever been to a nuclear disaster in our whole entire history. But I just want to know if something happens, are, are we prepared in any way to handle situations? I mean, that's why I invited you and invited the police to fire. What are we, what are we going to do if something happens tomorrow? Are we prepared in any way to, to help the people? Well, that's what I want to know. That's what Bob wants to know. Okay, so discussions we've had, inventory we've purchased, um, depending on the type of disaster, we designated the senior center for a small event where we may need to put like 30, 40 people up. We have the high school comp, Chicopee Comp would be our main shelter if we needed to. We've been working with the Red Cross about a regional shelter, which would then bear down on us a lot of resources nationally to help out a city. Um, but that's, there's some politics involved in that and we would have to go to the next level after that with you guys. As far as, you know, we do the best we can to have ideas on events and how to handle them. But like everything's real world and you just you deal with it when it hits. I mean, from from what you've done so far in the past has been, uh, you know, complimentary. But I'm just talking about, you know, the Big Bang thing. You know, I mean, are, do we have anything in place? That's all I want to know. Not that I are know. Are we just going to take it, you know, or as, as a or nuclear strike? No, nothing. Years ago, we used to have blankets. We used to have cots. We used to have, we water, have cots. We, have, we have blankets. We have stuff like that yeah, or to start a shelter, sure. yeah. okay. you know, 125 of them. But. Again, we're thinking more in a natural disaster term, not a nuclear strike term. We have any kind of like MREs or anything like that? Uh, no. 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 Okay. Chief, would you like to say anything on it? Or? Jocelyn, I, I think for what we normally exercise and plan for, that we're, we're prepared and we're in good standing. But uh, if you're talking a, a calamity such as a nuclear event, say if we were targeted, uh, which I agree with you, we're at a precarious point right now. Uh, I don't know if we would have enough current resources to, to offset an event like that. And then I think we would have to be concerned about personnel to serve the public at that time if there was a catastrophic event. Could we be warning the people ahead of time to, to put supplies away like, you know, like, it's, the, it's like Red Cross does and... I think it's always recommended to to have a two or three day supply of bottled water and maybe some yeah. canned food for for everybody. You know that's that's kind well, of been think, told like throughout the weeks. years. Because yeah, three or four weeks, because you can always rotate your stock. You don't have to. It's nothing that you'd lose. But I'm just I'm just uh, worried that we're not going to be prepared, whether it's nuclear or otherwise. Right. You know, with the way the weather's been going throughout the country, you know. I, I just don't want to be left flat footed as a city. Oh, I understand. And that's something we can we can definitely get together and discuss more and see what what options we have uh with the resources available to to maybe put something together to to propose for you if you'd like. Katie, do you have any comments? Huh? Um so when talking about personal preparedness we actually just held a personal preparedness training at the senior center. Mayor View came, he attended the training. We gave out backpacks to get people started with emergency supplies that they would take with them if they had to run. It had a list of what they would do for a three-day 
plan, like have extra glasses, have extra medication, have extra hearing aid batteries, those kinds of things in their go bag. And then it also had some information on what to stock or store up for a longer term. Um, We did see during the pandemic that sometimes when things happen in our nation, essential items do become difficult to get. And so people are doing a little bit more stocking up than they were in the past, but it had information on both, how to make an emergency go kit to be independent for three days. And that's kind of what, since Hurricane Katrina, um, FEMA has been teaching people across the country to be prepared to be on your own for the first few days till shelters can be up and running, till people can be relocated, that kind of thing. So um, I agree with you on personal preparedness, and we've already started that with that training session just a week or two ago at the senior center. Is there something that we could possibly put out through electric light, some kind of notice? Four or five years what, ago, what they should be doing for three days a week, a month. Four or five years ago, I did put out. I used electric light, will allowed me to print out, and I printed out a preparedness <laughs> list of that that I knew would get to every household in Chicopee. And I, we were going to do it again now. That you know, it's been five years. I know it would be it would deal with preparedness for civilians, seniors, and even your pets. It will give you three sheets of things that would be complementary to you know stockpile and prepare for. So that is something we're going to do with Chicopee Electric Light probably this year. All right, I'm good. I've got it. Sure. To be perfectly honest, they're, they have representatives at our LEPC meetings. They do work with us, but there are things that they, you know, there is a difference between military and city, and there's always going to be that little wall of, you know, so I don't really know, depending on, there's no way to know, depending on how bad the situation is, how hard they'll step in, you know, where they draw their line. Just, we know that up front. You have met with the yeah, we, I mean, I know the emergency manager, they do go to our LAPC meetings, they are part of it, but there's still a difference between military and civilian. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> <laughs> it's a, I believe it's an annual training that we do. It's a, basically a tabletop exercise that uh, Westover and the Metropolitan Airport puts on every year. They get the local responders in there to see how we would uh, address and respond, usually to an aircraft style accident, either on or right off base in our um, area of responsibility. So we do get all the, the local players involved and acclimate to each other and what we can bring to the table at those events. Yeah, thank you. Um, to all three, uh, I know you know. I know we have mutual aid with Hoyoke and Springfield, and if something happens around here, we wouldn't be looking for Hoyoke or Springfield because it, it probably would be affecting them too, being so close. But is there a way that we can like uh, get look at mutual aid from like further out exercise? Uh, because we are vulnerable being having West over here is get them coming this way, but just having communication contacts. Um, from somewhere, whether it's from coming from the Cape, yeah, it's going to take some time. But it, our mutual aid here, we we do great with Hoyoke and Springfield. But no doubt that would probably be effective with them right here, taking care of their own cities. So I'm just curious if we can get like something where we can have mutual aid contacts and say, hey, can you help us with this, this, and this from further out to bring it closer? That's sure, we absolutely and we do have contacts. Uh, we've okay. been called and tasked to to go out to the eastern part of the state before. When there was concerns for uh, civil unrest, our, our team, the Ludlow team, deployed out to, to Natick to help. So as, under the EOPS umbrella, uh, the Secretary of Public Safety, they have contacts, they have the Fusion Center, and they have Great. a list of assets throughout the state that they can contact and be able to deploy. And we have that. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. That's, I'm all set. Yeah. There's also um, a fire mobilization task force and an ambulance mobilization task force. So recently, I don't know if you saw, there was a fire in the Brockton Hospital, in Brockton, Mass., and the entire hospital had to be evacuated. And every single patient either relocated, um, most of them to another hospital. Some of them were able to go, you know, get somewhere else, but the majority of them were relocated to another hospital. And that was all done by activating the ambulance task force. So say, for example, 
the local, they're overtaxed locally because of the fire, then ambulances from across the state would respond there to do that. Or as they're transporting the patients to backfill to respond to medical emergencies. And so Chicopee belongs to that. We could be called, but we also can call for the task force at any time. And then there's a, a, a fire mobilization plan as well. So we've been planning for that. Um, I worked since probably 2007 with some of that. And then we've also, there's also, uh, you know, mass casualty plans that we've drilled and practiced. And there is a mass casualty exercise coming up locally for, you know, large scale exercise for Western Mass. I believe it's in May. I have the date somewhere. I can look that up if you, if you need the date for some reason. No. But we, we do regularly train and we do participate in these in case there is some sort of large scale event. Well, I, I, I want to thank Councilor Roy for asking these questions because it's good because I didn't know that. And people ask me that question. We have those answers. And I'm glad you, again, we know you guys are always working hard on behalf of the city looking for ways to keep us protected. So I'm glad we, we have that context. Thank you. One of the things you guys know, a web EOC. So anytime there is a disaster or we're doing an event or something, the web EOC goes out to the whole state and you literally can punch in on on you know on your phone or whatever your needs so if it's all happening in western mass and you have a need you can punch it into web you'll see they'll bring people from the other side or equipment generators whatever they'll bring it you know towards us and help us out that's how it all works thank you yeah thank you kind of dovetailing your comment i i was looking at the suggestion of having joint exercises with our state partners as with the resources that they have but even the training they could help us, and I know that we have a reciprocity of sorts, but again, looking at the state level, what the type of budget they have and programs, it probably would be an excellent night. Just don't know, we're in just the time. Again, thanks for what you do. Through our LEPC, which is Local Emergency Planning Committee, which is basically all the city players and businesses. We are going to be doing an exercise this year. We have to do one every to get certified. So we will be doing a table talk exercise. Not sure what the disaster is. I don't know what they could you remember what they said, what the subject matter was going to be. Is it going to be a chemical spill? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do some coordinated effort type thing where MEMA will be brought in the web EOC and we kind of fire up our EOC for ourselves for good practice and good reflect. Thank you. I'll say, Mr. Bellick. Yes, yes Glenn, sir, just one. Uh, you know, you talk about all these agencies together. I just, yeah, first is schools involved with this? Um, the, the school. Let's say it had happened during yeah. school hours. Yeah, no, the school is involved, and we do have an agreement with the bus company. Should we have to ship people? But the school would is made aware of everything because we know it'll affect them as it affects us. Yeah, and sure. they do their own drills too. They have their own. They have some of their own things that they do on their own too. I have a question. Yeah, oh. Two quick questions. So I noticed on the uh, assets, three light towers. Is that in addition to the three we have in Lolo from Homeland Security, or is it those? Are those the three? Um, that's just our three. Okay. That the city or our department owns. That we own. Up with okay. The right. And then, do you Which ever happens? work with uh, Medical Reserve Corps? Because prior to COVID, uh, we, we just, typically yeah, train. We, actually, um, that just kind of got refired up. We just had, we had a meeting probably a couple months ago explaining that it's kind of got rejuvenated and. Right. We were doing, doing chemical warfare, chemical, uh, biological warfare training, disaster training. Um, I've been doing all that with them, but it's like we might get them together with us because uh, they have a lot of assets and yep. education and training too. Uh, go ahead, yeah, Councilman Roy. If I could ask you a question, Chip. Natural disaster we'll during the day. Sure. Uh, Scott Chaplain, Director of Maintenance for the Chippewa School Department. Natural disaster during the day, school day. What happens? The kids, is there, are there sellers? Um, there, there's not sellers. Uh, we have uh, evacuation points that we go to, Knights of Columbus, AMVETS. We do have spots we would go to if there was a problem, but we don't have a, a seller or something to go to, no. Immediately, where would you go? Gymnasium? We'd shelter in place until it was time we were cleared. Auditorium, gymnasium? It all depends what kind of disaster it was, no. what was going on. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, uh, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak on this? Go ahead. Name and address, please. Sure. Uh, Lisa Bienvenue, 34 Everett Street. I just want to throw one thing out there because it is 
changing, which I think you guys are more than well aware of, that it's not just natural disasters that are happening. There's a lot more that's happening now. Um, but the other thing is there's a lot of stuff out now with cybersecurity and how cybersecurity affects your um, communications and stuff. And I don't know if that's part of the planning or if the IT department gets involved with that at all. Um, with you because that that's the huge thing now is how is how is um, the technology um, subverted um, in in the in the thing and that's the only thing I'm gonna gonna say because there every day there's new things coming out from Homeland Security on on the cybersecurity and how it affects um, preparedness and contingency planning and and you uh, and you have and there are a lot of documents online. Um, because of things like the pandemic and, and things that you have to do for community planning and stuff through the CDC and plans that you can put together and the way you can do them because you because now that we've had that first one and I know we'd all like to think that it's never going to happen again but uh, everybody has seen how much that's affected businesses and everything else that you kind of have to build those contingency plans in so that's, that's all I'm going to say but I know you guys are more than more you know more than any of us know so thank you else in the audience All right before i make a motion to place on file i'd like to thank you guys for responding we appreciate it very much our, the subcommittee and the council as a whole and the city thank you very much i want to make a, no, a motion to place on file in a second to place on file Councilor Zigorowski? Yes. Roy? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Lavrie? Yes. Yeah. Cushing? Yes. The vote is five to nine in favor, zero none. Roll call. Oh, we already did. Oh, we did. Okay. Awesome. Roll call for that. Awesome. All right. Next item on the agenda. You know, the DW superintendent to the public safety subcommittee. It's planned for pedestrian safety at the March 15th subcommittee meeting. Well, that was changed from March 15th to. Motion to amend to reflect that change. Motion to amend for change March 15th, March 23rd. Roll call. Councilor Zagrowski? Yes. Roy? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Labrie? Yes. Hussein? Yes. Public okay. input on this right now, and I'll make it as pro as a councilman can change. On it briefly. You have three minutes. Try to fit it all in. Um, my name is Catherine Pierce. I live at 35 Beaumont Avenue. That's in Ward 3. Um, so I'm going to tell a little bit of a story. Um, my church is across the street from General's Liquor. So when the gentleman was hit and killed, um, that was actually a night we were getting ready to go to church when we got the message, don't come. We can't get into church because someone's been killed. Um, uh, to back in December of 2021, I emailed this committee about the speeding in the school zones and I raised my concerns because of what I was witnessing when I would drive my kids to school. To school. My kids walk now sometimes and they have to cross Chickabee Street. And I will tell you, like I make them call me every single day because I'm holding my breath going, don't talk to me, pay attention to the road, make sure the drivers see you. And I wait and I listen for them to cross that road and pray I don't hear them get hit because people fly down that street. We've had so many people killed on those roads and nothing has changed yet. Um, I emailed my counselor um, at one point and I said, you know, I don't like to complain. I'm not a complainer. I don't come unless I have a solution and I don't have a solution for this. She said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to place orders. She placed orders a month ago for those to be put in. The day after she placed those was when Brumid was um, hit um, at the corner of Florence and Chicopee Street. My kids' friends heard that man get hit and killed. I just listened to the city council meeting from Tuesday and found out that there's flashers put out in front of city hall, but you still haven't done anything down on the streets where people are actually being killed. 
So I don't, again, I don't like to complain, but I'm just wondering when something's actually going to be done. Thank you. Name and address, please. Susan Santoro, and I'm very happy those doors are shut because you can't leave. Your address? 987 Chicopee Street. I have even gone to Boston to find help because no one, no one, Bill, has been trying to help me, but I can't get anybody to listen to put something on Chicopee to slow the traffic. I have now gone to call the PVTA to slow those buses down. I have started calling trucking companies to slow their trucks down. I have to go across the street to get my grandson. I take my life into my hands. I don't understand why we can't get something done. We have two temporary signs at Generals. That's what we have since November when the first pedestrian was killed on Chicopee Street. The CPD is the only people that are trying to do something, but they can't be there 24 hours a day. I get no satisfaction. Where's the $200,000 that was earmarked for the flowing of the traffic in Chicopee? Thank you. Uh, Lisa Bienvenue, 34 Everett Street. <laughs> The safety of the streets has been a concern of mine for months and months and months and months and months. Um, and I've gone to many meetings. This is bigger than any ward. This is bigger than the DPW. This is the city. This has got to be the message from the mayor and it has to be the work done by the city council. And it can't be piecemeal. We do this street, we do that street. That's how you get into the old Lyman Road um, problems that the neighborhoods feel that they think they know what's best for roads because they drive on them or they've lived in a neighborhood for 60 years or Chigby Street's always been this way. We have to commit as a city to having safe streets, which means that we need long-term planning. So that's money that's planned for this year, which is already spent. Those are jobs that are planned. It's money for next year. It's for the year after. It has to involve the planning department. It has to think about community development, of which you guys are looking at putting in hundreds and hundreds of apartments in the city and thinking that that's not going to affect the traffic on the roads. It all plays in. It's got to be the plan. If you look at, I think it's the 2040 plan for the city of Chigabee, it talks about making safer streets. But that's not what's happening. And, and I agree. You know, I, I don't want anybody to hit, be hit coming into City Hall. But that's not the priority. There's no parking across the street from City Hall, but that's where we've got the flashing lights now, even though everybody parks on the City Hall side of, of, of Front Street. And there's nothing wrong with having the flashers there, except that we've had how many pedestrian fatalities on Chicopee Street, on Meadow Street, on Springfield Street. We had somebody hit on Broadway. We've had somebody hit everyone. We, you know, and... And there is a lawlessness in the city. On my way down here tonight, coming down Montcalm Street, where it's a double yellow line in front of the park, apparently going 25 miles an hour in a 35, you know, a 30 mile an hour zone was not fast enough. So a car came up behind me and passed me on the double, double yellow line to, to stop at the red light at the Buffalo Club. And then proceeded down the hill, riding the cars in front of them because to go 25 miles an hour down the, down the hill, which nobody does, because, you, you know, I work like heck to try to get it, because you got to ride your brakes all the way down, but then they don't want to stop at the light to go underneath, because there's no, no turn on red there, so they pull in where Leadfoot Brewery is to cut around and go and get on Chickabee Street. So we have to, we have to take it seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Rich Jones, One Exchange Street. Um, I know we're all here for the same reason for, for this particular safety. Now, what, what do we do from here? Who knows? We're putting up signs, we're putting up flashing lights, uh, we're putting up speed bumps. What's not working? 
it's the drivers and the pedestrians. One of those two aren't paying attention during any particular accident, in my opinion. Um, I was out here in front of City Hall yesterday, for instance. I come out, hit the flashing light. I'm just over the double yellow lines and a car is coming flying by me right here. And, you know, I saw a woman coming in who the cars aren't stopping for her. Um, it's, it's just crazy. Um, but really, I mean, if anybody in the public, anybody who wants to, uh, you know, complain about everything that's going on, let's come up with a solution. I don't have one. I really don't. Um, and it's a, it's a tough one, but, uh, thank you all for all your hard work. Thanks for public input. And address, please. Sean Goon in Six Lincoln Street, um, on the corner of Lincoln and Broadway. Um, this is primarily directed towards the DPW department. Um, just but, in a chair. Right, yeah. So um, are they aware that the number one solution, the number one way to help solve uh, speeding and pedestrian fatalities on roads is to narrow wide roads? Are they aware of that? Because I feel like once she speaks, she's going to say we're working on speed bumps. And well, this that. is me speaking. So okay. I feel like she's going to say we're going to be working on speed bumps. We're going to be working on flashing beacons here and there. And what about this, the space, the mileage in between these crosswalks where people still speed because the roads are wide and that encourages speeding? So you can solve it at the at the crosswalk, but you still got people speeding for the entirety of the road on these main streets. I live on Broadway. Okay, and this is the number one way. I will say this every single meeting if I have to. I'm running for city council. I'm going to reiterate this every meeting if I have to. The number one way to solve road safety is by narrowing the roads when they are too wide. As, as well as improving crosswalks, as well as planting more trees along the road, uh, creating better tree belts with tr planted trees to slow people down that way. You know, you can talk about, was it the driver's fault, putting the blame on pedestrians? People make mistakes. Pedestrians make mistakes. It shouldn't be a life or death, death situation every time a person steps outside. And, you know, at the last, uh, a couple city council meetings ago, a uh, person in my neighborhood, Reverend Tetherly, he spoke about how he almost got killed crossing Broadway and he looked both ways, but he didn't look the third time. That's a, that's a minor human error, but because of the way the streets are designed, that car was speeding and came right up to him and almost killed him. I'm going to speak about this more and more in the coming years. Hopefully I'll get elected and I'll, I'll be able to make some change because I don't think it's going to be solved today. The also public a second time. And One second. It. Susan Santoro, 987 Chicopee Street. I'd just like to tell you that Gary's sister is here tonight to listen to everything. I'm going to cut out public input now. I'll get back. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to bring up a couple of things is um, I did a little research on this and I agree, agree, agree with Mrs. Demenu that, you know, things happen and we, we react too fast sometimes and not think of the whole plan and work on the whole safety plan of the street. As she mentioned, she's at our meeting all the time and we wish we could solve everything at one time, but we're not going to be able to do that. Let me give you just a couple of examples. And I feel bad. I, I actually, um, Gail and I went to school together. I'm so sorry to hear about your brother. Um, but um, you take, for example, what just happened on Florence and now, do we need to do that? I know we've been on the phone with them. They're looking into stuff. It does take time because there's certain things you've got, guidelines you have to follow for speed, for putting, I put one on Granby Road. It took us almost five years to get a crosswalk. And that was hard to do by Hanks because someone almost got killed there. Um, and we had one, we're working on one, Gary, Consul Labrie and myself, we had two people get 
uh, killed right at Lanky's. Uh, I'm sorry, at the uh, Lucky Strikes. Uh, Lucky Strikes got killed several years ago, and we're trying to plan that. And working with the state and the DBW, they looked at what options of coming off of 391. It's not just say let's put in, it's going to do it. It's speed bump. They don't always work. Sometimes that makes it worse. I find it makes it worse. So I, I agree. Uh, you know, someone made a comment about the sign outside here. Uh, that was in the plans on uh, two, almost a year and a half ago, two years. That that money was already designated. We can't pull the money back after we commit to it with the state. That was put in for the when we did the bike bike uh, path, correct? The bike loop. The bike loop. That was put in. So that was pre-planned, pre-ordered, way ahead of time. I don't think they would have done it today if with all the other situations they would have put it as part of their plan but they that was spent there we cannot take money that we approve from the state and put it somewhere else we just can't do that so so just so you understand why that one is there that was two years ago that was planned to go over a year and a half ago to go there so i've heard that i did a little bit of homework and asking you know why did we do that i'm still waiting the one on granby road we're putting up poles and a lot of this stuff you can't even purchase right now the, the, the lighting, whether they're right or wrong of, of, of uh, blinking lights or do we put them in the, and so how they does in the road. I don't, I rely on the, uh, the super engineer and the DPW to tell us those answers. But yes, we need to do it. And I agree with everybody that's here. We don't want nobody. I don't want my, my son or any, or anybody or friends or relatives, they live down there in Willamette. They live in Aldenville. Nobody wants anybody to get, to get hurt or killed, God forbid. But we have to do it the right way because the liability, as it was mentioned earlier, liability becomes cities. If you did it wrong and you don't follow the state guidelines, because I've done a lot of homework on this, and I know Councilor Cushane's done much more than I do, but there is guidelines that you have to do to order to do, say, like Florence Street, they're going to have to figure it out, the distance and the, the amount of stop time in that. So um, I'm not going to go on a lot about it, but I just know that they are working hard on it and we're, they're going to try to do it. Uh, and again, I know several um, have died down there um, and, I, and I, I pray we have no more, um, you know, but people come from out of our city. We have a lot of good people in this city that drive, try to, they, they, they want good neighborhoods. And unfortunately, we also got people coming in from 391 and all other parts of the city that we that don't want to abide by our rules and our laws and what we're trying to do, as uh, you know, many people do, especially Mrs. Demon who comes to our meeting all the time. And I uh, and I, I I thank her for that. It's not that she's trying to; she just wants to see if we can continue to move it forward. So, with that said, I'm going to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I just want to address a couple of things. So, I appreciate you doing your homework on that. Um, flashing beacon in front of City Hall. However, part of the homework is also recognizing that even though that was approved two years ago, that's a completely different line item, a different appropriation than the $200,000 that was referenced tonight for public safety. With all due safety. respect, they're, they're saying that that should... Okay, I'll get my second time. Thank you. Yeah, you'll get, you'll, get, you'll get a chance to rebut as much as you want to me. Um, and so that's a second, which we know is often, that's a second line item here. Um, and at the end of the day, regardless of whether that was planned two years ago or not, Nobody is dying at this intersection. And so, although I understand that it was appropriated two years ago and that we just got around to it, that's lovely. But still, at this moment, people are actively dying in a specific section of the city. And we need to address that with urgency. This isn't, we're not going to wait two years for those flashing beacons to go up. I, I didn't say you did. Stop rebutting me in that way. You can talk during your second term. Just hear me. With right? all due respect. Just, just hear me. But also with all the respect, respect, stop stop talking back at me. Let me finish, and then you can you can rebut during your second time. Nobody nobody interrupted you when you were talking. Um, so no, we no, need no. to address right now what is happening in my ward and in Councilor Cushane's ward. We've asked for flashing beacons. I've heard the mayor say over and over, beacons won't stop cars. Neither will a light, neither will a police officer standing there, neither will a barrier for all we know. Those are all preventative measures. We can't say that we're not going to do a preventative measure because it's not going to stop the car. No, no, like you can't stop a, a driver if they're driving recklessly in that way. But we can do something to try to prevent it from continuing to happen. We can't use the excuse that it's not an all stop to not do something. And Councilor Cushane has done a lot of research. He's also put in for beacons in his ward. We, we, that needs to happen expeditiously. P people's lives are at risk. We've watched it. 
This isn't just like one fatality and one would be enough, but this has been multiple fatalities over and over in that specific area. I appreciate the police department for their increased presence in that area. I have noticed it. You know, that's my word. I live there. I see it all the time. And I've had conversations with Chief Major about this. And I thank them for increasing their police presence. I've had residents complain about that. They're like, oh, it's police alley now. You know, you can't go down and speed. I'm like, good. I don't want you speeding in the ward. That's fantastic, actually. But we, can't, we have to do more than just a couple of cruisers. We can't, it cannot all be on the police department. We have money that's specifically appropriated for public safety and for streets. We need to use it expeditiously. I think this is more important than potholes. I think this is more important than some of the other products that are happening. And although I'm not the mayor, so I can't decide what product gets done first, but I will advocate that the, the, the need is in our wards right now to put flashing beacons because people are dying. Thank you. Can I speak next? No, I'm just going to let Liz ever say because we need to hear from you first before any questions can be asked at the end of the day. So I just want <clears throat> to speak to some of the comments that were made. So just to give you a little backstory on the flashing beacons out front of City Hall, we had a bike loop project. We took it down because of the opposition. And that was grant money from the state. And we had to tell them what we were gonna use that money on if we weren't gonna continue with the bike loops. And therefore we purchased uh, rapid RRFBs, the flashing beacons for two locations. One is front, front Street and we actually had to tell the state where we're using them. So it's not that we can just take them and use them. I don't think this is working. We can't just take them and put them somewhere else because people, you know, unfortunately people died. We have a responsibility. We took that money and we actually, have to re it goes through the planning department. Lee has to report where we're putting that uh, and, you know, that we're, what the progress is in the, on those projects. And because of the delay in availability of products, that's why it took so long. Um, the appropriation that the mayor made of the $200,000, it was $200,000 because we did a mass order. We, did, we ordered 13 um, sets of those beacons so that we can install them when they come in. And we're not having to, you know, purchase a couple and wait and purchase a couple and eight. So we, we made a mass order. We, $200,000 order placed. Okay. It wasn't that we are sitting on it or not progressing these projects. We are, we're at the mercy now of the manufacturer, you know, and getting our products in house so that we can actually install them as far. And there's actually going to be a larger project that is going to go in front of city council. That's another approach appropriation for a safety project, which includes making modifications to the right of way on Chicopee street, including some other locations throughout the city, adding crosswalks, improving, um, corner, like uh, Cherry Vale. Um, so there's many locations that we're actually in the process of putting a project together. It was winter time. You can't put a project out in winter. Contractors are not working. The risk of weather and, uh, you know, snow and ice and uh, frost, they're not, you, you just, you don't, in New England, you don't do construction in the winter time, especially in the roadway when you're, you're going to be paving and you can't have settlement. And I know that potholes seem like, you know, they're not, shouldn't be priority, but they also cause car accidents. They also cause injury, damage to vehicles, people avoiding them. They swerve or, you know, damage their car. We see them in coming through claims and accounts all the time. So I just want it to be clear. DPW is not sitting on anything. You know, when we're asked to move forward with things or look into things, we do. We look into them right away. Unfortunately, this has become a real major issue. It was starting in November, and that is the winter season. We actually don't pave typically after November 15th. And so, and contractors, contractors shut down in the wintertime. We, we don't have control over that. So the engineering department's been working on putting together a project that's going to be going out to bid shortly so that we can do this big safety project. And then it's going to take time to install what we are proposing to install at this moment. And so, you know, I just, I, I don't, I know that there's frustration and I know it's unfortunate that these things are happening. And I wish, I wish I could do that and be like, okay, we're done. We're in place. No more, no more uh, pedestrian accidents. People are safer, but it, 
it's a process. There's a process that's involved in all of these things. If anybody has any other questions. Mr. Cushing, go ahead. So one of the reasons I asked for the meeting was to actually hear the plan. So meaning what's going where? Because I know you've ordered stuff and I, I understand it's not construction season. You got to wait and it's going to go out the bids because we don't have enough staff. So I'm appreciative to that, that it's all future long-term stuff. But I've, you know, we've talked about short-term stuff like the in-road signs that you don't want to do. But so two questions, it's what's going where? And then what are we doing for the short-term while we wait on the long-term? Do you have, did you bring that? The sketch with the plan. We don't have the plans aren't to presentation level yet. But what so we're doing, we, you can actually. Doug hard? has been working with on this project. Just. Doug Ellis, city engineer. Yeah, on the northern end of uh, Chickabee Street, north of the Y, we're planning on three locations where we're putting a median in the middle of the road, which will shorten the crosswalk distances. And those we will put those flashing beacons, and they will actually have a not just a pair, one on either side, but there will be one physically in the middle of the road. So that's going to serve to slow people down as well, even when, you know, somebody's not using the crosswalk. So there's be one at uh, Bullduck Lane, one at uh, Leslie, and one near Whitman. So those are all north of the Y. And then on the other, uh, many other locations on the southern end of Chickabee Street and Meadow Street, we're looking at all the crosswalks and what we can do to improve them. One of the things predominantly is putting, putting uh, the continental crosswalks because they're much more visible than just the two lines and making sure all the signage is there and you know, proper ramps and detectable warning strips and that kind of thing. How about speed table location? Uh, at this time, we were not planning on speed tables, uh, in particularly in that northern section of Chickabee Street. There's a few reasons. I mean, the you don't uh, guidelines say you don't put uh, speed tables where more than about 4,000 uh, cars per day. And Chickabee Street's, you know, 70 to 7,500 from older uh, traffic counts, and it's done, done nothing but increase since. Yeah. You know, and I, I just wanted to also add for uh, Doug, so that we're not waiting on our staff to install these beacons. We're actually including the installation installation of the beacons with that project. So the contractor will be installing them in mass, so that you're not you know, waiting for, you know, our electrician is being pulled in at the wastewater treatment plant because there's an emergency over there, you know. And so we are going to be including those in that bid as a, a significantly larger project. So just to confirm, I heard you speak about some of them in my ward. Do we have locations that we specifically are for sure installing some flashing beacons in my ward? Um, we're looking at doing something at St. Jane Park and uh, possibly at Florence Street as well. Okay, what about the other three I mean, locations? you know, other not, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to put one at every single location. Those are, because, those were not every single, they were like super main locations for crosswalks. So mm -hmm. one where Ruben was just killed, another one at Sarah Jane, Sarah Jane, another one at the other side in front of Stefanik. Like these were, these are, the locations were very thought out and strategic. Like it's not just like a random crosswalk at some random street that nobody. No, no, exactly. About. Yeah. We're looking at the improvements in, at all the locations, but not necessarily RFBs at every single. Thank you. And so this is information that's incredibly helpful to us. And so part of this, like, I'm glad that this meeting was called, but when these put, things are put on, you know, the meetings at the council meetings, it would be nice to get like an update without us having to call a separate public safety meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so the motions were put forth. We've heard nothing about it. It would be nice if, you know, during the mayor's comments, you know, when you guys are already talking about these kinds of issues, if you give us more regular updates, yeah, um, which I think we that always would be do helpful. try to do, but you know, like I said, we're still still working on uh, finishing it up it's because it's coming out in a couple of weeks. So. Yeah, we've been asking for updates. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, let me just talk on a couple of things. The other question I still haven't oh, gotten the answer to is a short-term solution. I know you don't like my idea, but do you have any other ideas? Something to do now while we wait for the major construction. Just waiting and see if we're just going to get killed while we wait. Or I know there's other things. There's probably more. I mean, I did a lot of research to come up with this with a beacon on top. But in, since you know, obviously you're a professional in the industry, you must know of other things we can do now while we wait to do the big stuff. I'm excited to hear you put three islands in because I thought it would only be one. So that's fantastic. So I, I understand the urgency to try to do something to fix this. But I can't. There's really no Band-Aid to temporarily fix the problem. A lot of this is driver behavior. It's not that 
adding a bunch of signs is actually going to change their behavior. You're hoping that it does. You're hoping that it actually helps cause, you know, but there, but I want everybody to be clear that this may not change. It, we may still have fatalities. It, I, I'm, I know that uh, Doug had looked up um, on police reports for the fatalities on uh, Chickabee street. Right. And I mean, a lot of it was kind of negligence. It wasn't that it was, um, lack of signage or, or or anything of that nature. It was unfortunately um, a mistake made and then it cost somebody their life. And I just, I don't want to promise these small fixes in the interim when they're not going to give benefit. And there's really not really much that you can do. You know, we put up the signs at Genro's to, even though it's not really a, shouldn't, it's not a legal crosswalk because there's no ramps there. You know, we, we put the signs up just to help with visibility. So with that project, you know, then the ramps will be in place and, and something more um, robust would be made, done. But I, there's really, right. And the, well, the tree coming down also improved. We took it down because it was gonna die with the construction anyways. And, um, but it also improves visibility, of course, without a tree blocking the sign, but. It was really for visibility. Yeah. Something with a flashing light on in the middle road is going to hopefully take a distracted driver to look at what's going on in the road until the flashing beats are beats come in. And I totally understand that. The only problem is, is that a lot of these young, maybe maybe not so young drivers, they use them as targets. Sure. They just run them over and they just hit them. And then you're just always buying new ones to replace them, even though they may spring back. You're now damaging. Yeah, but they're not kind of they're not crash rated. rated. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, um, I've looked over at the six thousand accident reports too. I haven't found one where they crossed the center line. But yeah. not to say that you want to do that. Right. I mean if somebody hits a cone and it comes down, nobody's gonna report that as an accident. They're right. you know, but oh. All set. Let's put this yeah. uh, unless there's another yeah, question. Second, Thank you. Second call. Thank you. I'm ready. I'll do my I'm three I'm ready, minutes. Frank. I'll do my three minutes. Love the uh, well, for, for, no, that's okay. Uh, it's good to have these uh, these debates and these uh, to dialogues. dialogues. But I want to thank Liz because um, I, I I call Liz and and um, uh, Mr. Uh, John here many times about what's going on because I hear it too all over the city and you know what can be done and and I agree with you if we could do something quicker. But I had our, I was waiting. Actually, we should have let her talk first. It would have probably answered most of the questions that were coming up about the outside here, particularly with that one there, the signs being put up. It, it was that it was there. They're still waiting. No different than we are with the cruisers in and the other things for our uh, equipment. It's all on back, and we all know that chips are you can't get the chips for them and all that. But um, I'm I'm going to uh, mention again to Mike, uh, uh, the chief of staff, to Mike Peace, because I did ask the mayor, and I told Mike in one of our meetings that we want an update monthly of what's going on um, with the the process of what his plans, your plans are regarding, so the city council will can go to their wards and tell them what's going on. So she's correct. I did, we did say that at a city council meeting. I'm the one who brought it up to Mike, and Mike wrote it down and was going to look into it. So we'll make sure that does happen, that we're all in communication with that, because it's, it's, it's important that we communicate that. Um, so I, the only reason I brought up across the street again is because I got a couple phone calls. Why did they put it there? And I did call Liz, and it was, can't use it nowhere else. We're waiting for the other part. So if we get this one, yes, nobody died there. But thank God if it saves one life at this point, because we're still waiting for the other side. We want the beacons. It's all coming in. And as she mentioned, and she told me that the labor's involved in all that to get it done quicker, not to use our own force. So we're going to see as soon as it does get here, it, it done in a, in a fast, as fast as they can. So I just wanted to, to bring that, uh, it's, you know, and believe me, the city council, as president of the city council, I, I'll speak on behalf of the whole council. We will support any money and funding from the mayor uh, regarding safety of for the for the residents of the city. All of us, we're all uh, committed to spending whatever it needs to do that, whether it's ESSER funds or whatever. The mayor is working on it, and as he comes before this board, I know we're going to have 13 votes to do whether it's for the police department for more overtime or road work or whatever it needs to be done. We'll support that on behalf of the whole city council. Thank you. I want to say one thing. That light at City Hall, 
I remember talking to Ms. Batista about this about two and a half years ago, and the reason I brought it up, not that somebody got killed, but one of our city employees was crossing there and got hit by a car. And I said, we've got to do something for the safety of all the people that come into City Hall. More and more people are coming here. So I was responsible. I remember I spoke to you about that. So there was money available. I said, one right there. We're trying to, I worked with Doug Ellis, trying to make people come around that curve at 100 miles an hour sometimes. So we are working on it. Now saying that, every month I get a report from the traffic division. I really appreciate it, Chief. The other night I read it. They had over 7,500 calls in one month. That's a lot of calls from our police department. And I think we, we need to hear from the chief of police on his take on all his speeding and everything that's going on. I think I have the answers in my own mind, but I'd like to hear it from you, Chief. Uh, we have been using overtime and grant overtime specifically for the crosswalk violators. And since March 14th, we've written 41 citations for cro crosswalk violations down in Willamancet, um, specifically in the Genros area. Motor vehicle stops on Chicopee Street in that same period, um, 232 motor vehicle stops. We've had 156 citations issued, five arrests made, 10 criminal complaints sought, uh, six reports made, and approximately 40 verbal warnings issued. So we're also trying to educate, yet again, the, the public, motor vehicle and pedestrian safety out there. We're gonna to continue to use the overtime funds. We're gonna to continue to use the grant funding. I've recently touched base with uh, the Troop B State Police Commander. They have some um, troopers available and some overtime that they're willing to deploy some troopers down here occasionally. It might be Memorial Drive. It might be the, the Willamancet area. It might be other parts of the city based on our, our needs and, and what we ask them to do for us. Uh, we're gonna continue our efforts. I think uh, our officers are doing a great job out there at, uh, in enforcing our traffic laws. Open that uh, once we get a few more, we, we did recently hire some more. It's going to take them, obviously, close to a year to get through the academy, get those numbers out there also. Um, and as the Councillor Lopez and Councillor Kershane are aware, we did start a C3 unit down in Willamancet. Not only are they out there engaging the community, but if they see violations, they're taking enforcement action on it as well. I just want to say before I close this out, uh, we're going to take a, a comment. We're going to there. take a we're going to take a vote right here. I closed public input before, but I want to say just remember. I remember working for Chief Ferraro, and we had neighborhood meetings, which I attended 99% of them. All the tickets are given out and everything else. A lot of the people that got citations live in their area, so you know it's not always somebody visiting. I mean, people complain about the tickets they were given, but they live right on the streets that Chief Farrar was patrolling, and we're doing the same thing with Chief Nate. You have one more question, Mr. Goonan, yeah, go I ahead. I didn't hear anything about road and lane narrowing. Oh. I'll, I'll reply. There's supposed to be road engineers, and I'm a citizen, and I need to know more than that. Go ahead, Ms. Batista, address that, okay. please. Yeah. All right, I'm going to come up. Oh. Oh, public input. Okay, so um, uh, one form of traffic calming is road narrowing. Yes, you're correct, but where it's appropriate. And the cost of narrowing the road, pulling the curb out, because putting in a bike lane is not going to fix the problem because people drive over the bike lane. It's not, it doesn't, it's not true right. traffic calming or na road narrowing. To move the curb that throughout the city, it's billions of dollars, billions of dollars that the city doesn't have. So we have to be creative in our solutions. Unfortunately, we're not starting a city from scratch. We're designing all these roads from, from brand new. So yes, uh, Mr. Gunan is correct. A form of traffic calming. Yeah, narrowing of streets, absolutely. But is it appropriate? No, for us.
But to, just for the record, how many streets do we have in our city? Oh, gosh. Over 1,200. <laughs> I think 1,500. 1100. Oh, okay. 1,100. 1,200 streets. We have a lot of streets. Yes. Yeah. So we're going to address a lot of problems. Thank you very much. Can I make right. a motion to place that file, please? I, I was back. wondering if I just have a question. I'm sorry, just quickly. We talked a lot about behavior in regards to traffic. Um, is there anything that we can do to adjust behavior? I mean, we've Maybe heard through the school warning. department have a learning, ongoing learning program in the schools so these kids know what they're facing when they go out on the, on the road. Everyone said signage has been addressed, DPW has done a great job, we all know that. Um, but what's the next step in regards to how are we going to address the behavior? Because if behavior is a major component of this, what are we going to do about it? My suggestion is maybe we should get better with the schools and do a traffic safety program on an ongoing basis, not only through the police department, but through an actual curriculum. Maybe we can look at something like that. Because many years, I understood the, the safety problem in regards to public safety, and maybe we could look at <coughs> behavior. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. All right. That is not Ms. Lopez. <laughs> I, she would the love floor. to be with you. There's a motion on the floor right now. <laughs> well, not quite. Exactly. Councilor Zagorowski? Yes. Roy? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Labrie? Yes. Bouchain? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, the minutes of October 20th, 2022. <laughs> Motion to accept the Thank minutes you. of October 20th, 2022. Councilor Zagorowski? Yes. Roy? Yes. Lopez? Labrie? Yes. Cushane? Yes. Motion yes. yes. to adjourn roll call. Councilor Zagorowski? Yes. Roy? Yes. Lopez? Yes. Labrie? Yes. Cushane? Yes.